So I think we'll get started. Um, it, you may have joined us following our initial postdoctoral fellowship webinar yesterday. That recording is also available. I'll share a link to that, to that in the chat uh, for additional follow-up. But for the most part, let me just get started. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today. We're very delighted to host this info session on the host institution aspect of the Maurice Klodowska Career Actions Postdoctoral Fellowships, uh, and that's with a presentation from Southeast Technological University in Ireland. First, I'll briefly present on your access services uh, and then introduce our main speaker. Uh, by way of uh, housekeeping marks, I'll just please encourage you to submit any questions you have in the Q&A box. If you have anything not question related, you can say, say it in the chat, you can introduce yourself, and we'll be monitoring that as well, but Q&A will be taken from the Q&A feature. Uh, afterwards. So let me share my screen here. If there's any technical issues, I'll invite uh, my colleagues just to unmute and let me know. So very quickly, uh, one important aspect of applying for the MSCA postdoctoral fellowships is having a host institution in mind. So that's why we're very thankful to have SETU uh, here today to, to explain that process. Uh, we're hosting this event virtually, of course. We are Euraxis North America. We are the hub of this uh, entire EU program covering the United States and Canada, although we obviously uh, welcome and try to provide any support services uh, to, to any researcher that contacts us. We're based in Washington, D.C. And for this very, very brief overview, we are an initiative of the European Commission to promote and facilitate the mobility of researchers and their career developments. Uh, this means mobility in, in both directions into Europe uh, and out of Europe. So in this case, regardless, again, of, of your uh, country of birth or your nationality. Uh, we're trying to promote opportunities in, in Ireland and in Europe, as well as opportunities for people currently based in Europe uh, to go elsewhere, including to the US and Canada, uh, with some of these great funding programs. Um, we disseminate opportunities for researchers of all nationalities in all fields who want to create partnerships with Europe. Uh, generally, when we say Europe, uh, if you look at this third point here, we mean all EU member states, as well as countries that pay into the research innovation budget of the European Commission. These are called the associated countries. So this is just over 40. Uh, I'll show in, a, in an upcoming slide all of these countries, and they also have your access offices within those countries. There's national portals, and they are country-specific experts. So if you ever come to us and you have a question uh, that we might not be able to answer because it's a bit too specific based on a, on a funding program or on a country, uh, the local your access rep will be able to help you there. A really good example of this is your access Ireland. Uh, they're actually quite known for being very uh, skilled and knowledgeable on visa matters. So I would highly encourage you if you're interested after this presentation, SCTU is a host institute or Ireland is, is a country to carry out your research in, uh, to contact your access Ireland. We're very happy to put you in touch as well if you just send us a message. And as a quick reminder, all of our services are free. So whether you want us to co-host a webinar of interest to you, or you have certain topics you'd like us to focus on, uh, just get in touch with us uh, via social media, by email, let us know, and we'll, we'll try to build something with you. Uh, I'll just leave with this uh, quick overview of what the main sections of the Your Access North America website are. So there's a jobs and funding database. This is sort of our bread and butter. It's updated live at any given moment. There's generally about 13,000 uh, hiring opportunities. There's a partnering tool and hosting. I'm sure our main speaker today will, will be discussing this a bit more in depth. This is where you can find host institutions. Uh, we have career development opportunities. This is where we have pre-recorded uh, training sessions. Last year, we had a really in-depth five-part webinar series on academic publishing. And then we have information assistance. I mentioned that there are your access national portals, for example, and within Europe, there are over 600 individual your access service centers that have regional expertise as well as functional expertise. So this is where you can say, I'm interested in Southern Ireland as a destination, and I specifically want to know about uh, the ocean science. And you'll find you'll be able to find within those 600 uh, different service centers a relevant point of contact who can, who can provide you expertise in that area. So your gateway to all of this is through us at your access worldwide. Like I said, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we cover all of North America. So regardless of your research career stage uh, or your, your field, we're here for you. We are your main points of contact, and we'll definitely get you in touch with the appropriate uh, counterparts in Europe as well. So I mentioned the 27 EU member states and then all of, those, all of those additional countries in the region that pay into the budget for research and innovation. You can see them all here and they do all have uh, country specific national portals. Uh, so I'll encourage you after this to also, in addition to the, the SETU university website, to check out your access Ireland as well. So I'll share some links in the chat uh, it, right after I introduce our main speaker, but I leave here our contact information. Uh, also joining us today virtually, not presenting, but uh, monitoring the chat and here to support us all is my colleague, Dr. Daria Bukner Karajan. Uh, so between the two of us, we make up the Your Access North America office. We're very happy to be in touch with you and uh, you'll get a follow-up email from us most likely tomorrow with a recording and the presentation. So right here, I will stop my screen share and introduce our main speaker. 
So thank you very much. We're joined today by Dr. Geraldine Canney. She is the head of research at Southeast Technological University in Ireland. She was formerly the country's uh, Maurice Skodowska Career Actions National Contact Point, or NCP. And today she will showcase SCTU uh, for its research areas and the support provided by the university to incoming applicants. So if you'd like to conduct a fellowship at SCTU, uh, thank you for joining us today and please feel free to ask questions after her presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here today. I'll just share my screen there and I hope that's visible to everybody. Yes. So my name is Geraldine Canny, as mentioned, I'm head of research at Southeast Technological University. Uh, this is a university that has recently been formed from the merger of two institutions that were founded in the 1970s, Waterford Institute of Technology and Institute of Technology Carlo. So as a combined entity, uh, we are a technological university with, with 18,000 students and approximately 1,800 staff. We have almost, we have approximately 600 research active staff or researchers and over 400 postgraduate research students. So the precursor institution, uh, Waterford Institute of Technology, had the highest research funding drawdown of all IOTs or TUs in Ireland under Horizon 2020, the former European framework program. And uh, SETU has long and extensive collaborations with institutions in the so-called non-academic se sector, be they industry, charities, governmental NGOs or hospitals. And on our two main campuses in Waterford and Carlo, we have located four Enterprise Ireland technology gateway centres that have a long and established reputation of collaborating very effectively with enterprise. And you can find more general information about research at this, um, at this link here shown at the bottom of the slide. So that's us as an overview of the institution. Now in terms of us and our commitment to researchers, well, we're a signatory of DORA and we hold the HRS for our award, which was renewed last year. This is really a sign of the quality of the institution as an excellent um, environment for researchers and career development and training and personal skills effectiveness and other transferable skills and other discipline specific skills is something that is very important to us. Um, we have a range of training and mentoring programs offered here to researchers at SETU. And if you apply to do a fellowship with us, you will be able to avail of those and further information can again be obtained at this link. So I will now um, showcase some of the research being conducted on both campuses. Firstly, for the Waterford campus, uh, in terms of IT research, our flagship is called the Walton Institute, which is located on our West Campus here in Waterford. And here um, at the Walton Institute for Information and Communication Systems Science, we have over 80 researchers working on diverse and multidisciplinary projects ranging from artificial intelligence, quantum, agri-tech, biomedical nano and molecular telecommunications. And this entity, the Walton Institute, has drawn down in excess of 140 million euros so far from research and industry collaborations and further information can be uh, obtained at this link here. Uh, here are a couple of projects funded under the former framework program, Horizon 2020, which were coordinated by the Walton Institute on the Waterford West Campus. Demeter is an RAE involves the large scale deployment of farmer driven interoperable smart farming Internet of Things, and this is being conducted across 18 countries. The second project is devoted to health related research. It's also a research and innovation uh, action that is developing an artificial intelligence application that remotely identifies depression markers using federated learning in people that have undergone cancer treatment. And this, the coordinator here is Gary McManus working with Francis Cleary at the Walton Institute. So should those projects interest you specifically, I would invite you to consult further information at the links provided in this on this slide. The School of Science more broadly has various ongoing research and you can obtain further information at the link shown on the bottom of the slide. Uh, the School of Science has the highest number of postgraduate students uh, on the Waterford campus. And within the School of Science, there's the PMBRC Centre, which is a, a technology gateway centre 
It is an 800 meter squared state of the art facility with other, over 30 research personnel and multidisciplinary uh, research being carried out, particularly for across the domains of chemistry, um, pharmaceutical analysis, pre-formulation, drug delivery and formulation and molecular biotechnology. So here in the center, the orbital MSCA doctoral network project, um, as it's called under Horizon Europe, is coordinated. So a range of um, activities going on. This is just one project funded by the European Commission within the School of Science and within this PMBRC center. Moving on to the School of Engineering, uh, there are two larger groups that I would like to bring to your attention. First of all, the Sustainability Architecture and the Built Environment or Sabre Research Center that um, is quite newly established and comprises a number of research groups devoted to thematic areas in the realm of architecture and the built environment, including BIM and digital construction, design, culture and conservation and lean methodologies. Again, you can obtain uh, further information at the link here. The Convergent Technologies Research Group led by Professor Austin Coffey performs multidisciplinary uh, research. And one of the main fo uh, focuses of this group is to investigate smart polymer materials and novel processing technologies for biomedical and energy harvesting applications. Again, further information can be obtained at this link shown here. So that's in the School of Engineering. Um, the SEAM Center conducts a great deal of in, uh, in research in, uh, it's another technology gateway centers with proven and extensive links to industry um, enhanced bio, uh, biocompatibility for biomedical in, implants and anything regarded to metals and the metal additive manufacturing process and materials. Again, the director is Ramesh Ravendra. They have a limited um, ability to um, welcome fellows, but are really looking for top desk fellows if they wish to um, come to the SEAM Centre. Again, also on the main campus here in Waterford. And further information again can be obtained at this link. We're particularly interested in earlier career researchers having obtained their PhD in the last couple of years. And again, Dr. Ramesh Ravendra is the director and the main contact for the SEAM Centre. Now moving to the School of Health Sciences, there are different um, departments and centres. Firstly, the Department of Nursing and Healthcare, headed up by Dr. Sarah Kennedy. Here, research has been conducted on areas such as mental health and well-being, substance use and addictions, and they have a well-developed network of international collaborations abroad. The second department is the Department of Sport and Exercise Science, headed up by Professor Michael Harrison. And there, again, various research uh, being conducted, such as uh, primarily research into um, physical activity and such uh, exercise-related interventions in the context of certain um, populations, such as uh, frail older adults, or cancer sufferers. And they're also looking at sports nutrition and human movement analysis. So um, for these two departments, the contacts are Dr. Sarah Kennedy or Dr. Michael Harrison, respectively. The Nutrition Research Center Ireland is headed up by our ERC awardee, Professor John Nolan, and they work on the area of enhancing human function via nutrition and carotenoids specifically and they have various outputs for the measurement of visual function, in particular, more recently working on cognitive function as well. And you can obtain uh, further information about that group, uh, Nutrition Research Centre Ireland at the second link, but the first link will bring you to the main link for the School of Health Sciences. And again, we would encourage you to look at that, see if you're a match with any potential supervisors and to contact them directly if you're interested. The School of Business uh, has a long running uh, doctorate in business administration. The head of school is Dr. Tom O'Toole. And within that, there are two centers. RICON uh, down here is uh, co-directed by Professor Felicity Kelleher and Dr. Pat Lynch. And they conduct inter research in the areas of innovation management, lean methodologies, marketing and digital transformation, and tourism and rural development. So further information can be uh, found here. Um, a smaller centre for finance and business research is headed up by Professor Sheila O'Donoghue, whom you can contact. So again, I would encourage you to obtain further information at the respective links and to uh, contact those aforementioned supervisors if this area is of interest to you. Now, we don't just work on STEM, we work on business and also humanities. So in the School of Humanities, 
we actually have um, a range of, of research being conducted in four main groups, analyzing social change, crime and justice, spirituality in society and the professions and creativity in culture. Um, further information about the research going on here, which is listed on the respective sections of the slide can be found on the various websites. So again, I, I would, for example, the spirituality and society and the professions is headed up by Dr. Bernadette Flanagan, for example, um, and uh, creativity and culture, et cetera, one head of department there, I would bring your attention to is Dr. Susan Flynn, um, the head of department for uh, social care and related um, multidisciplinary research is also Dr. Lisa Moran. So their contacts that are available uh, by email that you can find, it's firstname.lastname at setu.ie. Again, firstname.lastname at setu.ie and you are free, feel free to contact them uh, directly as I've outlined um, on one of the later slides and consult the various websites. So again, uh, we look at lifelong learning and education and the head of school here is uh, Dr. Helen Murphy. And there they're conducting research related to policy practice and professional development in education, innovation and in teaching, adult education, lifelong learning, etc. So they're involved in various research networks across Europe and Asia, for example, that are listed here. And you can obtain further information about research being conducted in the School of Lifelong Learning and Education at this link shown here. I should also mention that the, this school hosts the CalMAST is our um, STEM engagement hub, but I would also add that this hub, which is co-led by Dr. Sheila Donegan and by Dr. Owen Gill, have a very long-standing uh, outreach engagement across the southeast of Ireland and nationally, and they focus not just on STEM, but they have the training for all areas of research. And so this is a training that you can avail of if you come to SETU as a postdoctoral fellow that you can avail of as part of your training plan in section 1.3 of the proposal is what I'll outline um, later on. So that's what a research themes on the Waterford campus. Now for research themes on the Carlo campus in County Carlo, slightly north of us. So there are various cores here. There's health core, enviro core, eng core. I deal here with the largest cores in terms of um, critical mass and research activity. The first of all, those being EnviroCore. EnviroCore on the Carlo campus is a world-class research center uh, focusing on research areas such as sustainable bioenvironmental technologies in the niche areas of ecology and biodiversity, um, biotechnologies for waste treatment, biomass, environmental monitoring and risk assessment, as well as using nematodes, for example, as environmental sensors. And with the latter respect, the co-director is um, Dr. Tomei Kuarte, who is one of the co-directors. And the other uh, director is Dr. Kieran Germain. And this is the main link here for, if you want further information about, about EnviroCore in general. I should add that EnviroCore is also a partner in a couple of Horizon Europe projects, such as Greener and also a partner on the MSC RISE project and, and those links are there. But if you wish to find out more information about EnviroCore per se, you can click on the top link here and get in touch with Dr. Tomei Duarte or Dr. Kieran Germain if you're interested in having them as host supervisors for your project at in the EnviroCore Centre on the Carlo project. So very much related to green and such related themes, bioremediation, environmental sensors, etc. The second main uh, centre on the Carlo campus is EngCore, which from the name is, as you might uh, guess, related to um, conducting multidisciplinary research uh, on areas such as smart materials and mechanics, circuits and systems, and the intelligent built environment. And you can obtain further information about the work going on at EnviroCore at this link here. Uh, the co-directors are of this EngCore are Dr. Dean Callahan and Dr. David Culleton. And again, for emails, it's firstname.lastname at setu.ie. You can contact them directly if, if the information that you find at this web link and the um, information and the, the various um, research projects ongoing within the Eng Corps are of interest to you in terms of coming there to conduct a postdoctoral fellowship. 
Design Plus, I mentioned, across our campuses, there are four centres, three in Waterford and one in Carlow, and the Design Plus uh, Technology Gateway Centre is located on the Carlow campus and provides a design-led approach to projects in the areas of engineering, ITC and bioscience. And there your contacts are Dr. PJ White and Dr. Brian Casey. Further information can be found out here. Dr. PJ White also conducts research on uh, interdisciplinary type research in the area of aging, for example. But I would invite you again to consult the website for further information and to take contact with them directly if you're interested by sending a CV, etc. So who are we looking for really as profile? Well, your profile as an applicant is that you should be maximum eight years post PhD on the submission deadline, which falls on September 14th this year. Uh, we're particularly interested in earlier career uh, researchers. And it must be said that the further away you are, the more senior you are, uh, from having obtained your PhD, the more competitive it is as you will be compared with your peers. You must be excellent for your career stage with the relevant publications, prizes and grants. And these should be outlined in uh, your CV, which is in part B2, do adhere to the headings provided. But you also show this and showcase your well-rounded profile referring to um, your major uh, prizes and uh, achievements in your CV in section 1.4, which is really the personal statement part of, of the fellowship. And in section 1.4, you really show that you are the best place person to win this fellowship. Furthermore, you should be proficient and in spoken and written English and you know, certified by a minimum score of 6.5 in the IELTS or equivalent, for example. So this is typically the, the well-rounded profile. If you're junior, it isn't expected that you have 10 publications. It's, it's again, you're compared to your peers, it must be commensurate with your career stage. And you should, again, show a well-rounded profile. So if you've done, if you've chaired events, if you've done research supervision, if you've taken initiative, if you've done science outreach, if you've organized science outreach events or had other such experiences and shown such initiative, innovation and leadership, do be sure that this features in your CV and that it's detailed so that it's clear to the evaluator in section 1.4 of the application. Now here are some tips for success. I've reviewed hundreds of, of uh, applications in my former job as national delegate and national contact point for Ireland for MSCA. And it's very important to show an international profile. So they'd like to see a person who has exhibited international mobility. And if you come from the States to Ireland, you're obviously fulfilling that. Intersectoral, they like to see uh, a secondment or a placement or a short visit in the other sector. So in this case, as this is a university, the other sector is the non-academic sector. And this is, of course, industry, government departments, NGOs, CSOs, charities, hospitals, depending on the pick number. So it's known from the pick number where, whether they're non-academic or not. But I can safely say that, you know, government departments, charities and companies and the enterprise sector are non-academic. So by carrying out secondment or placement, um, the placement I, I would remind you is, is you can have a, um, an optional six month placement at the end of your fellowship. This uh, fulfills the intersectoral requirement. And finally, interdisciplinary in the methodology section in 1.2, you're required to show how this is interdisciplinary, i.e. how you're going beyond one discipline alone and that how that's allowing you to address this problem or overarching research question that wouldn't be possible by working in one discipline and no, alone. And for that, of course, you have to have the appropriate supervision by an appropriate um, supervisor in that uh, discipline, but also the appropriate training. And those elements are detailed in section 1.3. You should also address relevant cross-cutting themes such as responsible research and innovation, gender, is shown in your methodology that must be addressed. Open science is also addressed in your methodology in section 1.2 and where relevant green elements. So it's not just about publishing in open access journals, which is expected or, or utilizing an appropriate repository such as Open Research Europe um, and, just, and detailing the not, naming the certain open access journals in section 2.2 and dissemination. But you must also address this by dealing with stakeholders and having open science and open data related uh, practices and adhering to the FAIR principles in section 1.2 in the methodology. Sell your science and address policy. In section one, you have to convince the evaluator of the need and the importance of your project to society and the problem you're addressing. 
provide data or stats or socioeconomic data in the first section, but also in section um, there you can address, uh, mention the relevant United Nations sustainability development goals. And as you know, this is an overarching policy framework. You can refer to the relevant UNSGG in section one, but also in section 2.2, where you're showing its, its, you know, its relevance to policy, to society, to technological advancements, innovation, uh, industry, economic policy as well. So it's important to address that in the relevant sections that I've just outlined in your proposal in part B1. Another common uh, problem is that in Horizon 2020, uh, applicants frequently did not provide sufficient methodological detail to convince the evaluator that they were um, that they exhibited mastery and were uh, using the appropriate methodology. So this has, in some uh, respects, been addressed by, uh, by having a separate uh, methodological section, which is 1.2. So now 1.2 is all about where you show the evaluator you're using the best state-of-the-art methodology or equipment or IT programs or archives with the appropriate controls. And gender, as I mentioned, must be addressed, how you will analyze this as part of your research. It's not just that you are a female researcher working with a male supervisor. That's not what they're looking for there. They're really looking to show that you detail how you'll achieve your aforementioned research objectives and how you'll achieve those in, in section 1.2. And you can refer to um, equipment that can also be referred to briefly in the final section, section three, but also in part B2. But really this must be with a sufficient level of detail to show what you're using if you are also going to be getting technical support, this should be mentioned in section 1.2. Detail your training which is appropriate to your career stage and your ambitions. This must be done. The first part of section 1.3 is about setting out the, uh, the credentials of your supervisor. So a main uh, supervisor and a co-supervisor is if applicable. If you're going to on secondment, you will have a co-supervisor there. If obviously you're going on a global fellowship and uh, not relevant to this because we're, we're looking to attract European fellowship applicants here. But if you were doing a global fellowship, you would of course have a, a co-supervisor for the outgoing phase in the third country. Now that's specific to the global fellowship, of course, but here you must detail the research and technical and transferable skills. So. A useful way to do that is, is think about your skills audit. Where are you now? What skills do you have? Where do you want to go? And what are the skills that you need training in and the supervision you need to get training in and support um, to achieve that? And so this should be detailed in section 1.3. It's not just about technical and uh, skills. It's also about transferable skills. And both should be detailed. Provide adequate details about how the modality, will you give a seminar? Will you give a webinar? Will you teach a course? Give the timing in your audience. So the month here, month 12, et cetera. And also describe what you'll do on the secondment and placement. This is for a European fellowship. Obviously, if you're doing, if you're doing a global fellowship, you will have to detail the training you undergo in both research and transferable skills during both phases, the outcoming and the return phase. However, um, and again, if you want to, you know, get in touch with SETU about that, that's also possible. But what frequently happens is that it's not given during both phases or you don't detail what training you will get during the secondment or placement in the non-academic sector. You must really give this detail during all phases and, you, you know, giving using tables to do this and show this succinctly whilst giving core text in the main text, but giving the bullet points in the tables can be a very effective way to show this to your evaluator. So again, do include the modality, how you're doing this to whom, and during what month. Will you simply name the month, month 12, month 14, et cetera, in the table. Now, again, I, I may have repeated this, but what, what errors should you avoid? So again, you want to set out the innovation. This must be very clear in section one. The methodology must be sufficiently detailed and link this with outcomes or deliverables. This adds to coherency, but it also should, and, and again, the, the deliverables are mentioned in section three in the work package table in later on in the proposal. But by linking those up and showing this is an outcome, this is an innovative output, you're linking those up and they're named in the work package table in section three. This can uh, render the proposal more coherent. Again, you want this to be easier for the evaluator to read and for them to find the information. 
Clarity and the bi-directional knowledge transfer is lacking. Again, bi-directional means transfer of knowledge from host to uh, the supervisor and the team around them in the institution to the researcher and by uh, vice versa, what knowledge you, will, you as the researcher will bring to the host institution. Don't forget to do, show this in both directions in section 1.3. Likewise, you should give details about the surrounding team uh, in section 1.2 if you're getting technical support, co supervision, etc., and networking opportunities, though you mentioned hosting also in, in uh, later on. But they should be mentioned in section 1.3 because you'll be showing the positive impact on your career of this networking in section 2.1 as well. So those dovetail. Those are linked to those sections. You can refer in section 1, 2.1, the impact on your subsequent career. Uh, you can refer to section 1.3 there. Frequently in the impact section, specifically section 2.2, people they confuse dissemination and con communication. Just to be clear, dissemination is of results to experts in the academic or the non-academic sector is applicable. Communication can start from the beginning of the project and is about your activities and is to the non-expert audience, to the layperson, to the public, to school children. Um, and for both dissemination communication, you can, of course, use social media, but you should differentiate between those and your audience and how you do that by having a very targeted dissemination uh, section in 2.2. Implementation uh, and the risks should also be detailed. So, of course, that should be in section 3.1 and evaluators frequently critique risks that are too generic. Typically, a risk should be included for each research work package and you should have a realistic mitigation plan uh, which shows, which at the same time shows you've thought through this and that it's feasible. So the evaluator wants to see that the project is feasible. You don't want to have risk there that puts it in jeopardy in terms of the implementation in the eyes of the evaluator and there as well. But you must have something that's quite realistic and quite um, clear and that isn't overly vague. Uh, the secondment or placement. So a secondment is different to a placement. The placement is in the non-academic sector at the end of the fellowship for a duration of six months. A secondment can be during the, the project at other times, and it can be in the academic or the non-academic sector, but it must be justified. It must make sense for the proposal. It must make sense for your methodology in section 1.2 and for your training plan in section 1.3 to show what you're doing where. And these should be fully developed in all the sections, for example, in the methodology, in the training, in the dissemination and communication. And likewise, if you have a secondment, um, the details for that must be given and the support available to you must also be detailed in the relevant sections, notably in section 3.2. The support available to you uh, should be outlined there as well. So our procedure, if you want to come to SETU as a host institution, as a beneficiary for your Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship project, we would invite you again to consult the information at the links, choose a supervisor as soon as possible and send her or him your CV and project outline at the minimum. If you have an English search showing your English proficiency, if that's necessary, if English isn't your mother tongue, that's, that's uh, good. If obviously you're American, you don't need this, but please do try to send your CV and a project outline as soon as possible to potential supervisors where you see a good fit, where you can learn things and where you can also bring in uh, new knowledge. The supervisor must agree to host you. Um, applicants then, where the supervisor has agreed to proceed with the application with the view to submitting before the September 14th deadline this year, will receive the following support from us, my team, an application handbook with detailed uh, advice about how to write the application, supporting documents and a personalized advice session by Zoom as well as a proposal review. So again, if you're to do this, the proposal would need to be largely written and then uh, I would review it. So that would be for the uh, very promising applications. But again, the first step is to choose a supervisor to have agreement with them and to have a Zoom or a Teams call or some virtual call as I'm assuming you're in another country to discuss the project with them, to make sure you're a good fit and that you can conduct a project 
that is of mutual interest where you can bring new knowledge that's valuable to us at SETU, of course, but you can also learn new knowledge. And successful applicants will, of course, receive post-award support. We have a finance office here who has um, ample uh, experience with uh, financial reporting, advice about subsequent funding applications. So, for example, during your fellowship, if you're successful, uh, you might want to apply for an ERC starting grant with us as host organization. We'd be more than happy to support with that and provide training. So I would say that with respect to the budget, you um, enter that on the portal and it's automatically calculated based on the person months, which typically for a European fellowship without the placement is 24 months. And that's automatically calculated. If you come to us, not only will you receive such internal support, but you'll receive training in transferable skills, such as intellectual property, open science. We have support from a communications officer here for SETU, and they will, of course, help you communicate about any successes, publications, et cetera, that you win during the course of the fellowship, if applicable. We have a very nice training course that postdocs can avail of called the Broaden Your Horizons program. And this is run by our HR business partner. Further information about this program and transferable skills can be obtained at the link shown at the bottom of this slide. So again, if you apply with us, please engage soon. Please start writing over the summer with the template and the handbook that we will provide only for applicants uh, applying with SETU as a hosting organization. And please, uh, again, I would advise you to get in touch with potential supervisors as soon as possible and um, to peruse the, the information at the various things that I've provided. Um, I would say for the timeline here, the application deadline is September 14th. I always advise submission prior to the deadline in order to uh, um, avoid issues, technical issues with the portal, which can be uh, the case due to overload and a high number of applications being simultaneously submitted on the day of the deadline. Um, it takes five months, so you will obtain the results as to whether you're successful or not, hopefully yes, in September next year, and then you engage with us. And, I, and also we have strong links with your Access Ireland, as was previously alluded to, um, and there we can get information if you need a hosting agreement, which you would need um, to be employed here through the HA if you're a non-European citizen. That's all fine, and we liaise, our HR department will also liaise with your Access Ireland for that in time. So please do plan ahead. We hope this information is uh, interesting to you and that you might consider applying with SETU this year or next year as a hosting organization for postdoctoral fellowships. So thank you very much for your attention. This is our e email address uh, for further queries and I'll, I'll gladly take any questions you might have at this point. Thanks again. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Uh, what I'll do is I'll invite anyone in the audience to submit a question uh, via the Q&A box. And then depending on the level of uh, interest and engagement, we could potentially use the hand raising feature. Uh, but for the most part right now, I just want to monitor the Q&A in the chat. And if there's nothing, what I can do is, uh, Jolie, I can invite you to, if you have any commonly asked questions that, that maybe you haven't addressed in the presentation, if you want to lead with one of those, uh, but but if that's not, uh, if, if you've touched on everything, we can definitely leave it at that and then uh, make sure we process the recording. I'll upload it most likely tonight or tomorrow. And then all of the uh, audience members and the registrants who didn't join today will all get a follow-up email afterwards. Thank you. With a link uh, to recording. I would say, I, thanks a lot. That's great. I would say that a commonly asked question is regarding eligibility. So for example, um, a person of American nationality wishes to come to SETU are they eligible as an American citizen? Yes, all nationalities are eligible. They must just uh, fulfill the criteria that they must not be the eight years beyond the obtention of their PhD on the application deadline. And if you're a more junior applicant, you need to have def successfully defended your VIVA by the deadline in September. So uh, that's a common question. As I mentioned, the budget depends on the country you're coming to and the country coefficient, and if you have family, and that can be altered uh, over the course of the fellowship as well. But typically, that is uh, automatically calculated on the portal. Part A provides information about ethics, um, and you should complete that, but we can give further information about that, and it can be referred to that you'll, be, you'll get the appropriate ethics authorization prior to commencing the research can also be mentioned in the methodology section. 1.2. Um, those are the most common questions, I would say, Jackson, in terms of eligibility. 
Great, thank you so much. Well, I don't see any questions at the moment. I think you've given a lot of great comprehensive information. And what we'll do is we'll work with you to uh, make the presentation available afterwards, primarily so people can have everything for reference, but then also click a lot of the links uh, that you've mentioned. And then uh, we, people will have not only archive information, but yours as well. So I'm very thankful. I, I give the floor to you for any closing remarks, but uh, unless there's a last minute question I see come in, uh, I just wanna thank you for the, the really great overview you've given. Thank you very much. And many thanks again also for the for the, the invitation here today. We hope to hear from um, applicants from North America, Canada, various countries, as long as they have an excellent profile, we'd be delighted to engage with them further. And thank you again for inviting me today. All the best.